Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's baying of the hand. So you'll notice that it's a little bit wide angle. This is because, he says, putting his hand in front of the screen. Um, this is because I want to be able to give you guys a quality insight and maybe some illustrations along the way. That's my camera is giving me shit. There we go, perfect. So here we go, let's try again. Good morning, everyone. So as promised, this is the video which is gonna give you the update on what happened on Friday night. Now, I'll give you some background on it first. So the individual involved in this isn't a complete stranger to me. Although he was a walking off the street in terms of the new place, he was actually someone that had trained with me in what we used to call the forge, which was when I was teaching at my garage based here. Um, this individual at the time when he came, if he did two lessons, I'd be surprised, but let's be generous and say he turned for two, um, two training sessions. One of the problems um, that I had with him, and in many cases he had with the way we did things, is at one point he was partnered with the Morrigan. And um, this is the previous time. Um, and his exact words were, quote, I don't want to train with a woman. So instantly you can imagine that, you know what, this probably isn't going to be a good fit for you because as we're very big on saying, there's no gender on the map. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that as soon as we get a new uh, girl coming in, we then jump on her and give her 10 belts, but we do give them pressure. The only thing we have with any individual that trains with us in the Havoc system is that we give you the pressure you can cope with at that time and try and push a little bit beyond it. So if you've never fought in your life before and you're actually scared of interpersonal conflict, you can be six foot eight and 340 pounds. We're going to go gentle with you. Similarly, if you're five foot two, 120 soaking wet, but have got an attitude like a honey badger and have been a fair few scrapes, we'll turn the volume up on you. So it's only within that that we have any gender on the mats. So, hey, well done. Hey, everyone else watching. So, um, that's just some background scouting him. So he did two sessions, and he was even then one of those guys that when you're doing a demo, would always then try and counter your counter or show what he would do missing the point of what we do. So unless you're actually having a fight, when you're drilling, when you're doing your techniques, I will feed you, say, jab, for example, and you'll practice a slip. Let's keep it that simple. I fire a jab, you practice a slip. He's one of those individuals, and as instructors out there, we've all met them, and as practitioners, I'm sure you've had partners like this, you'll slip the jab, and then they'll try and hit you with the cross or kick you in the shin. Not, and I'm not saying you can't do that as a follow-up, but you're moving outside the realm of the drill. These are the people that we used to call gamers. They would try and game the drill, get one up, because they're not interested in personal development. They're not even interested in helping you grow. They're interested in showing off what they know. So this is just to set the idea and give you the, idea of the type of person this is. Anyway, fast forward to Friday. Well, actually, no, wind back from Friday to Wednesday. Individual turns up, and it's the same dude, and he says, yeah, I'd like to come back and train again. Now, bear in mind at this point, we're going for a catch wrestling class. So we're wrestling down. And to say this gentleman had an aroma of, uh, of marijuana about him would be vastly understating it. He had an aroma of marijuana about him in the same way that the cod has a smell of fish about it. He stank, but sat there, made everybody want nachos and feel slightly nauseous. At the end of the day, he said, I'd like to come in on Friday. Do you guys spar? Do you spar? Do you spar? Do you spar? Always a bit of a red flag. Now, while I don't mind that being a question that people ask, if it's the first question that people ask, it tends to indicate there's a problem with that person. But you know what? He was polite enough. He said he wants to get back into training. He's just been training on his own and doing street stuff for a year or so. And yeah, you get the idea. So I said, yeah, no problem. Friday, we do six to seven for team training. Then we do JKD, then we do Cali. And I politely suggested perhaps a little less green might be an idea. So he left. True to form, turned up on the Friday. Now, came for the six o'clock sparring class as I knew he would. Um, so we didn't spar that class, we just did um, drills. We did sparring drills because I'm not going to put uh, a, a moderately unknown quantity in with the team because, you know, it's about development of the skills. Had had less green, still was a little bit right. Cigarette, alcohol, that sort of thing. I'm suspecting there was something else in there, but he wasn't high enough. This seemed to be one of those aromas woven into his fabric. So it was like a stale smell. So again, issues. Did his training and was okay. Couple of blips on the radar, but nothing that really gave me massive cause for concern. Um, but there was an indication on Wednesday that his mind hadn't really moved on from where he was. He'd previously started coming up with a million and one different options 
for a technique I happened to be shown and he was showing him from the bleachers so much so that Prodigy was actually starting to get quite annoyed with him but calm it down you know what people shout things out all the time you let them go so after sparring class finished on Friday this individual came up to me and he said do you do gun disarms that should have been my warning so in terms of a learning point for me my answer to that should have been no we don't do them please leave because a it's pointless. What's the chances of you actually facing a gun and being able to disarm it in a day-to-day -day situation? So low. The chances of being a victim of a violent assault are statistically quite low. The chances of that involving a weapon are even lower, and the chances of that weapon being a firearm are lower still. The chances of that firearm then being used as a kind of like sticking in front of you so you can take it off me, lower still again. But I do do it as part of my military syllabus that I teach to people. I have a Black Ops syllabus. I've taught people in military special forces. I teach CCW carriers. I've taught law enforcement. Obviously, that's my background. So being me, I said, yeah, you know what? I don't teach them commonly, but I do teach them. He then saw fit to say, well, yeah, this is the one I do. Go on. So gave him a finger gun. And his idea, and this is quite a common one that you see a lot. His idea was... You have a gun here, and you take it at the wrist here, and then you bend the barrel and strip the gun out this way. Now, there's several fundamental issues with this one. One, if you're not as strong as the person, or your timing's off, and when adrenaline's in, your timing's going to be off, this is a fine skill. It's a fine motor skill. A grab and a move is a fine motor skill. And fine motor skills deteriorate under pressure when adrenaline kicks in. Lesson number one for any combat situation. Second problem with this one, if you think of all the vital organs that are arranged up here, heart, lungs, all the good stuff here, throat, heads even in the vicinity too, anytime I'm orienting something in this plane, if that even misfires, gets stuck, gets reflex shot, you're putting the shot into your majors. So I said to him, it doesn't work. Politely, I said, actually mate, so that really doesn't work, it's not going to work for you. What you want to do with any weapon is you get it offline. So again, Showing him the benefit of my knowledge. No, 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 it all works like this. He said, no, it doesn't work. Well, have you got a rubber gun? As luck would have it, we did. Put the gun on him. He tried it. It failed. I said, try it again. It failed. Try it again. It failed. Oh, it's because it's a rubber gun. I said, no, because your technique's not working, mate. Let me show you the correct version again. Went down, showed him, went down, showed him. He was still not convinced by this. Now, bear in mind, he'd also at this point said, when I point the gun at him like this, you're holding it wrong. I was like, well, no, that's how you hold a gun. No, 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 people hold it with one hand. Is it an argument I'm going to get into with someone who's clearly clueless? Probably not. Because if he can't move this one, he certainly ain't moving this one. But I gave him the what he wanted, and he still couldn't work it. I showed him how to offline it. I showed him how to minimize his chances of getting shot, and maximize his chances of dealing with a weapon. Still wasn't happy. So then he said, that doesn't work. So then I showed him what he was doing wrong to make it not work. He did it, and it worked. Lo and behold, I thought, maybe we have a breakthrough moment here and he's learned something. No. His next response was, well, no, mine still works as well. Look, try yours again. Tried it again, and by, he just threw everything into it, and my arm was here, and he ended up about an inch offline, completely off balance. And I said, look, you got a punch coming in here. The second I did this, this was the trigger point. The second I said, look, here's your line, you've not covered. His face shifted. And you get a sense, when you've been in enough fights, you get a sense between people when they're doing a demo. You get a sense between people when they are angry, confused, whatever. And that's part and parcel of being an instructor as well. So the second I said, look, your line's open here, his face went from slightly puzzled and confused with desperate trying to technique, and it made this. The furrow, the tightening, the clenching. Instant warning signs for anyone that's ever been in a combat situation because these are pre-attack curses. The second he did then is he came in full and he fired a back elbow and it was aimed rightly at my jaw. <laughs> seeing the face, seeing the move, all I did was I slipped inside. So what I actually ended up doing was took the tricep just on the side here, bam, jammed it down. Locked it off, hip throw down, pinned him to the floor. Once I pinned him to the floor, I had his head, I went into what we call pulse and case and I had a ground flow, lock off with a single hand, forearm into the throat, politely had a gentle chat with him, suggesting that this current course of conduct he was engaging in wasn't a good one. The conversation, I'm not going to go into exact details on, but by my standards was no profanity involved. Little volume, no profanity, not needed at this point. And as I said to him, 
You do not come into my dojo. You do not start fight with me, especially not when I'm trying to try and teach you something. Are you teachable? Do you want to learn or do you want to fight? His words, I want to fight. That's what I came for. Now, this was a confirmation of that little spidey sense that we always get going off. That was what he said. He wanted to fight me. And it was almost inevitable from the Wednesday evening when he came in and tried to show his arm again. But you always give people a benefit of the doubt and sometimes they'll surprise you. Sometimes they'll disappoint you, sometimes they won't. In this case, I was disappointed, but I wasn't surprised. As soon as he said that, the transition then came in, I took him out, pinned him down, put him in a back top wrist lock, and I said, look, I can break this off if you really want to go some further with this. Stop what you're doing, let's walk away. He kept going, took the arm lock off. I had a choice at that point. Do I break it? Could have done. Do I go to strikes? Could have done. But what did I do? Secured his wrist, sat top of him, and in a position, I put my elbow up here, and I held it, ready to strike if I needed to. Continue to talk him down. Are we good? Are we done? Are we done here? Is this over? Eventually, one of these monosyllabic questions got through to him. He decided it was over. It was at this point, I backed off. I was ready to go again. And my exact phrasing was, okay, now get your stuff. Get out of my dojo. His response, you're throwing me out? How he thought this was surprising, I do not know. So I said, you come in my dojo, you disrespect me, you don't listen to techniques, and you try and start a fight with me. Yeah, I'm throwing you out. And I made him go to the door. He left, as Morrigan described, like a puppy that had been bitten by the big dog, whining with his tail between his legs. He apologised again, offered to shake my hand. I shook it. I shook it. And I said, good luck in what you're doing. See you. No need to make any violence, no need to punctuate it any further. The conflict, such as it was, was now over. So what we now have is a situation that, could I have stopped that well before it started? Yeah, I could have just not taught the guy. But again, I always extend the hand of friendship and I always give people the benefit of the doubt. But there are several takeaways from this, and I alluded to some of them on the Friday. So we'll drill those out right now, you've got an idea of the background. So, first one we're going to be talking about is what I referred to on Friday as a scalability of response. Anytime you've got an individual that you're potentially going to go hands-on with, whether that's because they cut you up in traffic, they want your wallet, they're going to, you know, they're drunk, whatever it happens to be, their response and what they're giving you to a degree will elicit the response that comes out of you. Now, if we look at the bottom line of this, what we have here at the absolute top end is death. Okay, so that's the threat of death and it's the delivery of death. Yes, I know these are reverse rounds. You'll have to bear with me and maybe I'll mirror the image later on. Under death, we have what's referred to in the system as grievous bodily harm. This is maiming, permanent injury or quasi-permanent injury. So a broken arm is kind of the bottom end of this. Permanent disfigurement, crippling, that's the top end of this. So it's the same sort of thing. We'll keep it simple there. Actual bodily harm, bumps, bruises, contusions, that sort of things. And underneath it, we have assault by action. So in this instance, this can be thrown a punch at you, this can be a push, a shove, whatever. We have assault by words or posture. Now this can also be referred to as pre-assault. So in this situation, we have a pre-assault. Yeah, yeah, you want some, come on, yeah, yeah, come over here, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all the indicators. They've not actually assaulted you there, but all the things are there. And prior to that, we have verbal disagreement. You're having a discussion with someone, you're having a debate with someone. What do you mean that? I didn't say that. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. The old baseball bat rabbit is at the top of it. So if we look at these as our simplistic scale of what's in front of me, okay? Um, we can, I mean, we can have below this. Let's go, let's go right to the bottom line. Discuss. Discuss. You're having a discussion with someone and you fundamentally disagree on things. Each one of these can be considered a scale. Okay, or more accurately, a continuum. Because I've seen many of them go from discuss to death. I've seen them go from verbal disagreement to GBH and everything in between. 
because everyone has a different line in the sand. Everyone has a different point at which they're willing to then engage physically with things. So what do we need as practitioners and what do I always provide within the Havoc system? This is where we get a scalable response, okay? So if we start with death here, this is what we call the MDK options, the murder, death, kill. So if someone's trying to kill me, can I kill them back? In principle, yes. There's a caveat that's gonna go along with that in a moment. If someone's offering GBH, can I GBH them back? Yeah. Under certain jurisdictions, certainly within Canada, certainly within the UK, you can actually kill them at that as well because there's no requirement for you to let or have that ability to process it. ABH, what can you do with that? Well, you do what you need to do. Assault by action, they're trying to push you, they're trying to punch you. It's all the same principle. Generally speaking, and leaving aside nuances of law which are specific to jurisdictions like castle doctrine and all that sort of thing too, stand your ground, all those complicating factors that come into some of the US their jurisdictions, all the ones in Canada and the UK as well with regards to can you, can't you carry a weapon, basically the answer is no you can't, but you can carry a tool that can be used as a weapon as long as that wasn't the original intent, blah 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 blah. All of these require a scalable use of force option, so no matter what level I come at, my response to that has to be reasonable and necessary and proportionate. So this is dictated by circumstances. So if we deal with our individual that came in, what was his level of assault? Well, basically, it was assault by action. Potentially, there was an ABH situation. If I'd have been caught napping and he'd have clapped me on right on the temple, he would have probably maybe done a bit of damage. If he'd have really hit it hard on the jaws he went into, again, could have been a broken jaw or something. But in reality, we're down at this level here. So my response is at the assault by action stage. So this is the attack that's coming in. With that attack coming in, my response realistically has to be down here. So it's in this portion down here. It would be very remiss of me and tactically really stupid for me to take an assault by action and respond with an ABH through the death response option. This is what I mean by a scalable response. Now, had I blocked his assault by action and then the next thing I know his arms are around my throat and he's trying to strangle me, that might again necessitate a different response. Nothing's ever you do X, I do Y. It's a continual reevaluation and development process moving forward. So what did I do with him? Well, I simply did a reverse of what he did. I put him down on the floor, I pinned him and I controlled him. Did I strike him? No. Could I have done? Yes. Could I have justified it? Actually, yes, I probably could, but it was no need to because the decision to control him rendered the rest of his attack moot. Let's look at other factors that came into that then as we discuss what went on. So, first thing is size. If we look at the size of me versus the size of him, he was about five foot six, I stand about six foot two. He was about maybe a book 60, book 75, depends because he was a little pudgy, but he's certainly not an Adonis. I'm 220 pounds, as you may notice, I'm a bit of an Adonis. So physically, there was a tremendous mismatch there. So again, that factors into the response, because I'm a bigger dude, it takes less to control the smaller dude, all other things being equal. Skill. He actually did have some skill. He had a reasonable kick on him, he knew a punch, he knew a kick, he knew enough of what I call baseline combatives to suggest that at least there was an element of training present there. However, he's not 20 year law enforcement veteran. He's not a trainer of police. He's not a use of force expert recognized in all the courts. He's not a catch wrestler. He's not a Carly player. He's not a Jeep and doll man. He's not done boxing. He's not done full contact. He's not done any of this sort of stuff. So again, the problem we have here is that spare wind, just some noise coming from uh, from just over there. So the problem we have the, the problem we have there is um, we have an individual that has some skill, but his skill is lower than mine. So therefore, my response option is now tailored by the fact that my skill is higher, his is lower. We then have the situation where it comes into environment. I had all my friends around me. He didn't. So my environment. My response, I could have just held on to him and said, everyone come and help me get in. Mass attack comes into that as well. When we factor that into it, there's another response option that we could have done. So you see, these little bits are now colouring my response even further. 
this is out the outset. As the fight progressed, it became blatantly apparent once he was on the floor, he had no answer for what I was delivering to him. Because he had no answer for what I was delivering to him, again, I lacked the ability to then scale up through this. Because I can't say, right, I've got him even more helpless than he was when the fight started, and therefore I'm going to escalate and start putting some GBH in on him. Can't do that. More accurately, shouldn't do that. Because that's then going to cause me the additional problems. These are what we call impact factors. The reason I'm referencing my size relative to him, my skill relative to him, and everything else relative to him, is it factors into a question that was actually asked by Simon. And one of the questions was, he said, with your ability, your background, your experience, and your capacity to deliver these, pro these um, uh, techniques with relative ease, would that have changed, he said, had it been Morrigan? Had it been, and he used himself as an example with his current injury and his age and bits and pieces playing him up. And the answer is yes, no, maybe. Because it's always yes, no, maybe. So if we then say Morrigan's in my situation, so it wasn't me doing this now, this was Morrigan doing this now. A, she wouldn't have done good gun disarm, she'd have told him to probably get out the door. But let's take it that everything else is the same. Let's just swap the hound out, put the Morrigan in. Now we have signs. He's maybe the same sort of height, a sniff shorter, but he was heavier than her. So the size now tips to him. She's going to hate me for putting this, and although we teach there's no gender on the map, that does become a factor. Male or female, believe it or not, factors into what's an impact factor when it comes to both self-defense and for court proceedings. Generally heavier based musculature, more aggression, more testosterone. So a male response is considered, if he's attacking a female, must be lower than a female if she's attacking a male because she has to overcome that differential. Skill. Again, that's the same. Morgan is infinitely more skilled than this moron. But again, skill is always factored by size. So me pinning him down, I require less effort and skill simply because of body mass than Morrigan would. So again, there's a little bit of a balance comes into that. But on the skill side of things, that's a tick in her favor. So my is size, skill, environment, okay? And I'm also gender. So I'm considered strong in all these compared to this individual. Morrigan doesn't have size. She does have skill. She has an environment and she doesn't have gender. So she's already sliced those 50% off. The way it works is these aren't calculations that you put in your head and you go like the old meme with the, the equations flying across in front of the camera. These are things you have to be cognizant about before you even step foot on the mat, before you step foot on the street, before you take any decision. You can't make snap decisions like this. It doesn't work that way. So this also then ties into the concept of arriving before you leave. This is why you have to have a moral, ethical, and legal underpinning to the tactics and actions that you do. If you do not, the first time you have to then engage and think about that might be when you're in the middle of a fight. That's when anger kicks in, that's when adrenaline kicks in, that's when everything kicks in, and you're not gonna be able to process those thoughts. I have an advantage given that coming from a policing background, I've done 20 years where I was doing those decisions all the time. But before they led us on the street with a truncheon, a set of cuffs, a gun, wherever jurisdiction you come from, we walk through six months of training. We do the law, we do the morals, we do the ethics, we role play things. And it's amazing how many people within those environments will do things like shoot when they shouldn't shoot, hit when they shouldn't hit. Because again, it's a moral relativity. They have to try and factor this within their own head. Some people will shoot, other people won't. Doesn't mean that one's right and one's wrong. It just means that person formed that basis of that decision in their own head. And that's what happened here. This individual that tried to fight me in my class, tried to deliver an elbow shot to try and hurt me. He got put down, he got held, and he got restrained, and then he got sent on his merry way. Does this make me a moral philosopher and a monk? No, absolutely not. In my head, my urge inside was to pound him through the floor, make him a stain on the mat, mop it up, wring the mop out, and then pour it down the drain. But as much as I would like to do that, that's a personal feeling inside. So there's a subjective aspect to that. Objectively, I could not do that. So while any situation and any determination is a balance of subjective and objective factors, objective factors trump subjective ones in most scenarios. It's very hard for me to articulate that I felt threatened, endangered, at risk from this individual when you factor into account everything that transpired with it. I hope that makes sense. Any questions about that? Maybe 20, 30 seconds just to throw something into the old type. Meanwhile, I'll have a sip of coffee.
<laughs> okay, so let's move on to the summation of this. This is what I mean <clears throat> by a scalable <clears throat> response option. Most arts that you see based around what I call the combatives paradigm, which is, and I'm not going to name them because we don't want to get into a style war. Anyone that trains with me and asks you the questions will know what styles I like and what I don't. They will also know why I don't like certain styles. If you're interested, PM me. If you're not, take it as read. Some styles have better response options than others. When we look at some of the more combative based styles, they tend to do things like lots of strikes and headbutts and bites and stamps and all that sort of thing too. These are instantly in this category. They lack the capacity to actually scale it down here. If you're a knife-based system or a stick-based system, you're instantly using a weapon all the time unless you then translate that to empty hand. And I'm using some generic FMA systems as an example for that. There is a time and a place for all those, but it's not all the time and it's not all the place. If we look at the response options that we get by having a broad skill set, I can go everywhere from shouting at the individual, suggesting that perhaps this isn't a club for them, saying, you know what, that's your view, I don't think it's right because this, this, this and this, but whatever. Get the F out, pushing them the F out, gobbing them, breaking them, killing them. So you've got this whole response option that you can scale through depending on the response that comes to you. So if I just said, get out please, and he then swings a punch at me, we then instantly have that built up within there, okay? A note about tightening your chin straps after he left. Oh yes, we'll do that, Simon. And yes, John, I'm perfectly aware that this is reversed because it's live and that's the way my camera works. Thank you for noticing. I did mention that before I started writing. Um, so, Simon mentioned something which I was going to come on to, but as he's thrown the question, I'm pobbering into it now. It's called tightening the chin straps. So, there's an old samurai maxim. After battle, tighten your chin straps. So, this means when any situation has been done and dealt with, we then have the aftermath, a little plug there, see what I did? So the aftermath aspect of this coming in. Now the aftermath can be several things. This can be him coming back with a weapon or something, in which case you've got to be prepared and ready for that. He could come back a couple of days later on, so you have to psychologically prepare yourself for that. He could have gone to the police. Um, he could have come back with friends. All this sort of stuff happens. Similarly, someone else could have come in and done a similar thing, or someone else could have come in and made me have an adrenaline trigger, which would have necessitated a high level of response simply because of my viscerals to it. There's a million and one things that can come after this. And again, you have to be prepared for these before the situation happens. So if I know there's a risk of an individual coming back in, do I want to then absolutely pound the snot out of him? No, I left this gentleman relatively unharmed. He might be a little bit sore, but that's about it and I let him walk out on his own. He was humiliated a little bit, but that was it. There was no injury, there was nothing else that he can come back without me at. He tried, he failed, he left. That's the way it works. So what we actually have here now is a situation whereby this individual could come back and try it again, but what's he gonna gain further that he, he already knows he can't outfight me. So there is a potential escalation there, but I didn't give him anything to really escalate from. He tried something, he got pinned and he got thrown out. Legally, I'm well placed as well. I did absolutely the minimum that was necessary in the circumstances. The only other thing I could have done was have taken the shot and say, oh, that hurts, please leave. But again, I had no requirement for me to take a shot just for the sake of making an easy transition. So legally, I'm pretty well covered too as well. There were sufficient witnesses there that saw the whole thing go down. So again, I spoke to those afterwards. Okay, guys, let's see. What did you think? What did you see? What did you hear? You tell me. I didn't tell them what happened. I let them tell me. That way, I'm not coloring anything, and it's their responses and reactions. One of the parents and one of the children that was actually leaving when it all went down actually saw it, and her initial response was one of shock. Morgan kindly called her up after me and chatted to her and said, look, did you know what happened? Because all they saw was big dude smashing little dude because they hadn't been privy to any of the precursors because they were doing something else. So again, this is tightening those helmet straps because that was the only witness to the sequence of events. All you see is me beating someone up. So you have to make sure that everything's ready. This is where we get into conflict articulation, justification pieces, which again, we do ahead of time. We have these reference points ahead of time, so we know how to deliver these things, and we know how to then prepare ourselves afterwards. I've prepared before I left. I don't need to worry about anything else coming through for the simple fact that I'm good to go, I'm legally placed, I'm morally placed, and ethically placed, and I slept just fine that night. I wasn't even angry, I was annoyed but I wasn't even that angry. Does that answer the question, Bulldog?
hope so. So, coming back to what we were saying here, if my only response is to smash them, I'm missing this. There's a gap in my training. If my only response is to talk to them, I'm missing this. There's a gap in my training. If my only response is to pin them to the floor, I'm missing this. There's a gap in my training. So when I refer to what other styles do and what they miss, it's not to say they're wrong because they fulfill a niche. Let's use the MMA paradigm. Striking, grappling. Um, so we have punching, kicking and grappling. That's basically your three ingredients. I can remove any one of those ingredients. So I'm just a kicker and a grappler. I'm just a grappler and a puncher. I'm a puncher and a kicker. I can remove any one of the ingredients and possibly have success to a point, but there will come a time when I will need a solution for a problem that's not one of my main skill sets. I have to have this in place. If I remove any of these, I'm not prepared for a fight in an MMA match. I'm a gambler. I'm gambling on that. I won't have to deal with someone that can out punch me and count my kicks and my grappling. When it comes to self-defense, we have exactly the same problem. If I don't have a scalable skill set, I'm gambling. I'm gambling with my ability. I'm gambling with my ability to deal with someone peacefully, to talk them out of it. I'm gambling with my ability to kill them. I'm gambling with my ability to pin, whatever it happens to be. So if you are honest with your training and you reflect back on what you do, how complete is what you offer? How complete is what you train in? And how prepared are you for dealing with what is out there? Because you could go here and you could go here. One of the reasons why it's a good idea to have pens in incident report forms if you have a permanent venue, if there's an accident that can be done on the spot for insurance, and if there's an incident, I'm just going to scroll through on that, John. Like this, it gives witness statements that are independent. Yes, absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. And if you don't have pens and papers available, do a voice recording, do a little video, do a little talking head. The original statement made is the first record of events. So if I write that down on the back of a packet of crisps, that's my statement. Any statement coming from that is fine, and I can rewrite it and flush it out. That remains the original. This is why I always advise people, never make any statement within 24 hours because your recollection's really poor. At best, you want at least two to three hours for the adrenaline in the situation to come down and let it leave your system, okay? So if you're not talking to people straight away, and by people I mean if it's like you're being questioned by a police officer, unless it's obvious, guy came up and swung a punch, I blocked it and hit him, that's fine, okay? I'm not saying it's you know black and white. But unless it's a very, very obvious situation, you want to take time to consider what happened because you will not know. Things will come back to your memory and your recollection as a result of adrenal stress and a result of the situation that you did not think about at the time. This is important and this is why we have to take our time. Good. So that's basically an overview of what happened and those are the teachable moments that we can actually extract from that. The other one is don't actually teach anyone that comes in stinking of marijuana and cigarette smoke. Just tell them to get out. It makes life a lot easier. Okay. I'll leave the camera running for about a minute or so if there's any more questions or comments, I do welcome them. And again, this is just an introduction to the kind of concepts we're actually going to be doing at Habit University. This face-to-face, -face, this presentation, and yes, John, the writing will be the other way around on Habit U when it's not Facebook Live. But this kind of face-to-face -face interaction, lecture, and presentation forms a massive part of what we do with Habit U. It's going to be online, it's going to be virtual, you're going to be seeing me lecturing, you're going to respond to lectures with questions in some cases, or just taking notes then sending questions later on if it's a set video. Same with the physical techniques that we're going to be demonstrating. I'm genuinely excited about Habit U and what it represents because it's a way to convey accurate, correct and proper information to people in a structured format. So if you do have a drunken marijuana pigment coming in trying to start a fight with you, you at least have an awareness of what you should, should be saying and doing, and you have a scalable response option. Thanks very much for your time, guys. I hope it was beneficial. I hope it was useful. Um, feel free to share the link and uh, tell everyone about it. And uh, any questions, leave them in comments, throw them in PMs, message me, whatever. Okay? There we go. Have yourselves an absolutely amazing Sunday. Thank you for spending this uh, brief bit of time with me. And uh, until the next time, this is the hound sounding off. Cry havoc, and let's slip the dogs of war. <laughs>